Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Doug Migliori, and I am going to be presenting on cross-industry semantic interoperability and various consortia approaches to those or to that challenge and um, propose options to um, towards a, a center point within those consortia efforts. Um, I have over 20 years experience in in the supply chain and uh, retail system automation, and mobile application development platforms. So my perspective is really on business interoperability, which um, I see so many parallels to what's happening right now within Internet of Things and the challenge of, of interoperability um, amongst devices. So what I believe we can do is um, find a middle ground and a common platform that can support both uh, business and device interoperability. Taking uh, some of these complex um, approaches and, and different um, uh, standards and simplifying them through abstraction down to a, a common model. I have spent over two years, the last two years uh, involved with uh, uh, standards organizations and consortia that are trying to address this challenge. I've been working with on the business standards side, GS1, um, OMG, um, a couple of others. Then on the uh, device standard side, I've been working with IPSO Alliance and OMA and OCF and had some experience with the All Scene Alliance before it merged with with OCF. So uh, I'm currently a principal consultant with a um, startup company called Control Beam, which uh, provides unified commerce um, software as a service that's built on a an event driven platform as a service. So let's get started. So this um, presentation is really based on and, and summarizing a a multi-part article series that uh, is currently in uh, halfway through uh, publication. We've we published the first uh, five parts of a nine-part series, and uh, it's uh, pushed on a uh, uh, embedded computing uh, media site, and I will provide you the link to that at the end of this slide presentation. It is also um, available under the Insights tab of for the um, conference portal. Uh, it represents a, a collaboration of multiple industry experts that contributed to this um, that have a, a variety of backgrounds to really provide a lot of different perspectives on how to come up with a unifying model for IoT and business systems. Um, and many, well, all of the uh, the contributors participate in one or more of these um, uh, standards consortia. So the biggest challenge right now for widespread adoption of, of IoT, and if you look at that as an umbrella term that also includes uh, business digital transformation, uh, a, a unifying metadata or information model really has to address several um, different trends uh, that most of the models that are being uh, developed by the consortia individually don't fully address all of these, uh, these requirements. So this is the challenge. So there are uh, several industries that have um, interdependent use cases that all need to be able to communicate um, data effectively amongst their systems to really um, bring uh, the value of IoT to, to its, its fullest extent. The um, so that's one 
uh, challenge. The other one is um, you, if you just deal with interoperability from machine to machine and you just take that uh, interop to a cloud, and but you don't care what the data or what you do with that data once it gets to the cloud, then you're, you're forcing somebody else to take that data and and create custom solutions um, before they can use it. Um, the next trend is um, moving to the fog, you know, where everything is going from cloud computing um, to the edge. And so you're having to develop a model that can support both edge and edge devices and cloud servers. And uh, we were talking about the fourth one here, which was being able to uh, efficiently manage and share semantic metadata. So um, the semantics that enable um, all of this data to be understood by all of these uh, different types of devices from edge to cloud, you have to be able to share that metadata amongst the um, system owners for it to be, to be used. And so you have to be able to do that in an efficient way that scales. Uh, another challenge is um, by having all of the these semantics, um, you should be able to dynamically generate uh, user interfaces, human machine interfaces from from that metadata without having to um, hard code or program it within within the applications. And the last challenge would be to uh, eliminate, Middleware and custom system integrations, so that you know this the the, the uh, cost to value um, ratio significantly de decreases. So you're you're getting the ability to have all of this information usable um, uh, from its initial origination through its processing without having to do any type of cleansing or normalization. And all of these challenges then really have to result in a model that is simple, scalable, and sustainable, uh, very similar to how SMTP has been for email for the last 20 years. So semantics provides context to raw data. So if you take this example, which is a temperature reading of 77.6, that that value by itself really has no meaning, no context for which you can apply um, intelligence, you know, and processing. So to build up that uh, full context, you really have to start to include um, semantics or metadata components that um, include the, the the time that event occurred, um, the uh, attribute uh, that that value is associated with and the the object of that attribute that it's associated with and then any any unit of measure that would be relevant to that value so all of these um, all of these semantics can be uh, included within a time series which is basically a time set time stamped record of an event or a you know an interval based recording of a of a current state or a state change uh, of a particular object if we do have um within this time series a uh, a full context of metadata the challenge then at that point is how do you describe that metadata how do you describe those semantics and and if every vendor or is operate is describing temperature differently through a different identifier, then uh, wherever that data is being aggregated to, which would be typically you know in the cloud, um, you're having to go through the process of normalizing that data before it can be used, before it can be processed. So there's disparity of semantics between vendor systems and also between current interoperability standards. And all this needs to be addressed in order to really um, 
allow this data to be processed without having to be um, in a time consuming and costly mode of, of normalizing and cleansing this data before it can be used. So the um, what's really required at this point to make uh, to address all of those challenges that I, I described is a is to develop a common information model that really is abstracted to what I'd call the lowest common denominator, which can account for all of these different use cases across all of these interdependent industries. Um, and that's the big challenge because if you can do that, then you can work off of one information model. If, if you don't abstract it far enough, then you that information model won't be able to be utilized in such a universal manner. So you, you need to be able to incorporate a, a broad range of cross industry perspectives to get to that level of abstraction that's that's really required. So this slide is talking about um, those interdependent use cases for um, five related industries. Um, many of these are consumer facing industries or have a consumer facing uh, component. And those be homes and buildings, retail, transportation and logistics, healthcare, and energy. And each one of those industry has its own consortia developing its own interoperability standards. But really what needs to happen is those, um, those organizations need to come together to look at each other's perspectives and develop a, a common model between them. Um, the the uh, little diagram on the right shows where all this fits relative to the um, different uh, interop models. And so there's, you know, two that um, have, have really emerged, you know, certainly there's the, the OSI model, which has been around for a long time. And we're really talking about the top layer, that maybe the top two layers here, presentation and certainly application layer. Um, the Industrial Internet Consortium, IIC, um, modified those two, you know, the top layers of the OSI model to better reflect where, where we need to be focusing um, in a, in a, which is really with a syntactic interoperability within a framework layer and semantic interoperability within an information layer. These uh, included in this article series were nine um, consortia that are uh, developing um, interoperability standards or um, guidelines. Um, and, and, and each of them is focusing on particular industries and use cases. And that's where the problem lies because a, a fringe use case to one consortium may be a core to another. And unless you have all these perspectives considered, you will not develop a, a information model that is fully abstracted to accommodate all of these different use cases. So, all of these organizations, some that are focused um, that, that, uh, on business standards, that, that was their primary purpose, and those are the ones that have been around the longest, um, really need to come together with those that are um, more recently um, uh, involved with uh, or created to, to address device standards. Because um, everybody, at this, all these, these efforts, and these are just, eh, nine consortia there's there's you know several others that that are also moving towards that same direction trying to leverage their existing standards works um, along with with some others and trying to put all this together and this is where it can get very complicated and it, and you, it needs to all be simplified as much as possible so by simplifying it you can arrive at a blended approach that, um, that kind of moves towards the center point. And, and in this article series, we, we take which we think are like the best of um, micro approaches from, from these consortia and put them all together to kind of connect the dots to a you know, 
a uh, adequately abstracted model that can accommodate all of these different use cases. So these are the 10 that I, I will go through in the, in the remaining slides. So uh, one of the concepts is, what, um, is a top level ontology. So an ontology is uh, a way to classify concepts, which a concept can be can, um, also called a, a class. And so if you look at what a class is, a class is something that is a, a group of, uh, of like objects or things that each can be, where each thing can be uniquely identified. And a class can only be justified if it contains attributes that are unique to it. In, and you can have uh, subclasses of a class and where the subclass will inherit the attributes of its parent class but it also has unique attributes that warrant its creation. So there's a, a hierarchy um, of classes and subclasses that all result in, in objects at the, at the lowest uh, level. And so this is kind of a, what an ontology is. And then, and then a, uh, a top level ontology would be, what are those classes at the very that are at the very top right from which all other classes are subclasses too and if you look at what the consortia's have been doing they they have their own um, naming and classification uh, terms um, for uh, for this and so if you blend all those together to address again all these different use cases from business to device um, the approach on the right is is what um, it, it can can accommodate um, many of those use cases, and it all starts with an object. Right, is the uh, um, root um, class, and and from there you have your top level classes, and every object has uh, a set of uh, common attributes. And the uh, article series goes into um, great detail um, to describe all of this. Uh, the uh, information model, an information model can also be uh, defined as an ontology. Um, so data types can include, as a class, can include subclasses for number or string, and a number can include a subclass for quantity. So you can create an ontology for the information model itself. So another key uh, area here is how, how do you get businesses and devices, uh, those systems to interoperate? And, and uh, you have to, uh, if you look at all of this as systems, or you have a system of systems where a device isn't a device, it's really a, you have a, um, a system uh, assigned to the controller, right? And so it's really the system that is communicating with other system, which could be other controllers, or it could be other business systems. So if everything, or if a device and a business is all put in the, con um, in the terms of systems with, and each system has its own attributes, and there are attributes that can be in common between those systems that are all connecting together, um, then you are able to interoperate at that system attribute level. So this is um, where you're talking about having a system ontology that supports both business and device processes. So you're not looking at a a pro, um, business processes anymore uh, any any differently than you are device processes all of those are processes that can be defined within um, an ontology that that all get attached to to a, a system and what also can get attached to that system are attributes right and the attributes can come from on a business ontology that defines order attribute you know attributes for like a purchase order but it also can come from a device ontology where the attributes um, can define, uh, can be defined for specific product types, you know, a controller versus an actuator versus a sensor. 
And, and those are really the three foundational um, uh, device types that really roll up into as, as uh, components of all other devices. You know, a refrigerator is going to be a, uh, a combination of uh, controllers, actuators, and sensors. So is a, so is a car. So you can, um, with this foundational uh, device ontology, you can build it up um, to support all of the, the assemblies that result in a more complex device. The, um, uh, the other kind of key concept here is that a, that time seri series, um, a, a common structured time series can be utilized for both uh, uh, device state changes, you know, change in an air temperature, change in uh, 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 a speed of a fan, but it can also be used to record the state changes of business information objects like a sales order, purchase order. And by having all of that normalized um, in one structure, then you're able to um, uh, trigger events from anything, from any type of object automatically. So we've covered um, so far um, ontology. So where does that fit within the um, interop stack? Um, that would fit at the top under the information. But then underneath that, you need to have, be able to connect those ontologies to the, the transport protocols. And uh, one way to do that is through a, a, a framework called DDS, which is um, uh, standard developed by the OMG. Um, and that's a whole different way of looking at things where it's using a data bus rather than a database. And there really is no type of message structure. But for all these other transport protocols, all those can benefit from one common API and message payload format. So let's go and look at that. So um, if you look at the transport protocol protocols and the messages that you're transporting uh, with using those protocols, if you if those messages hit a common API gateway first, it's kind of the front door to everything else then it really standardizes that that uh, data structure the syntax of that message you only have to uh, format it for one common api rather than a separate message format for a variety of apis um, and then behind that common api is is where you have um, all of your other services your your common application services and then domain specific services, which you could consider microservices at, at that point. And so the top level ontology will support um, the processes within the application service and the domain specific ontologies like a business ontology will support those, those domain microservices. And this is um, building off of or blending um, existing architectural styles such as DDD, MDD, event sourcing, uh, command query, uh, responsibility segregations, putting all those concepts together to define simple and scalable uh, services uh, for what I'm what we'll call distributed object management within a system of interoperable systems. So the uh, from you know from that model what the a way a syntax that you can utilize um, to be transported as a message payload um, between um, these devices from edge devices to the cloud server it could be a 2d array you know a a, a grid um, a grid can easily easily support result sets but also that time series data so just um, Packaging everything as a two-day um, as a grid structure um, is a, an efficient way to to transport everything and maintain a uh, common syntax. Um, 
then behind on the right side that you know uh, behind that common api gateway is where you're in those in those uh, grid payloads or you're going to have you know events and you're going to have you can have queries you can structure a query uh, in a format of a grid which is what the project haystack does and uh, those uh, grids can then be um, routed to, you know, if it's an event grid, it can be routed to an event processor. If it's a query grid, routed to a query processor. Um, and then those application services, which would be in common, right, part of the common um, services that could run on any device, would, would also have identifier and unit conversion services, which could work off those that top level ontology. And then everything can be all that time series, um, th those time series events can be um, uh, persisted in and read from um, an event store. And so how does the event store concept work? Well, an event store can persist the state of the objects um, by appending uh, a new uh, event um, whenever there's a state change of an object. And you can't, um, uh, you know, in to the event store, only things can be appended. You cannot change what's been added to an event store. So by disallowing the changes, um, that event store can provide a reliable audit log for all changes made to that object. And by <clears throat> by looking at or by retrieving the uh, uh, the events that were most recently added to that event store for a particular object, that's where how you can obtain from that uh, that event store uh, the current state of any of any object. Um, this is just going in detail of you know, how an identifier conversion application service um, would work and that would be like taking uh, an identifier for air temperature you know and converting it to another identifier format but it can also be used uh, for um, uh, you know any type of identifier in this case it's showing um, uh, gs1 has identifiers for uh, locations and product ids um, and how those can be converted to to other um, identifiers that would be you be being used by a different system a similar um, conversion service for measurement units so you can be taking fahrenheit and converting it to to Celsius, you could be taking US dollars and converting it to euros. You can structure a common unit conversion service based upon that top level ontology as well by looking at the, the unit um, uh, class, object class. And by having both business and device state changes funneled through the same time series structure you're able to have these microservices consume and produce events that affect both device state and um and business information object state so you could have a a fan failure um, produce a an event a time series event that gets routed to a microservice that could automatically generate a uh, an order for a replacement fan and it is generated uh, as a, a set of um of events that that define that that order then last the last um approach we want to talk about today was just dynamically generating that user interface human machine interface for ontology metadata so by taking all of this uh you know building off of all all the previous approaches by just adding a a runtime interface to that common api gateway it can leverage all that metadata that defines these top level ontology business ontology metadata and data to dynamically generate a a user interface on a phone uh on a uh a coffee machine um, a, you, you could have it um, take uh, store the uh, the metadata within a coffee machine and then connect your phone to it and retrieve it and display the 
uh, you know, remote control that coffee machine from, from your phone um, through that dynamic uh, user interface. So it, it allows that, can, that user to um, really take that phone and be a remote control for anything without having to have a, a, a separate siloed application installed for every device that he wants to control. It can be all controlled from one, one application, one, um, one uh, UI framework. Um, and this is showing how using that ontology and, and uh, common uh, query processing service, how you can um, translate from one human readable language to another. For that for that dynamic uh, user interface. Okay, so putting it all together, then by having that common API gateway is the front door for all um, edge devices and cloud servers. It allows you to take that common structured time series and uh, and use that structure to um, transmit these events um, from one machine to another that can record or, or uh, broadcast a, an air temperature change in a, on a floor uh, that can trigger uh, the speed of a fan to be changed, uh, which then you can use it to show or to record the failure of a fan which can then trigger the creation of a order for a replacement fan, which can then trigger fulfillment of that order, which then can trigger uh, a, you know, a truck going or uh, recording um, the, the change of an inventory location as a truck goes underneath an RFID reader, which can trigger a change of status um, of an order to shift, which can then be that message can be sent to the uh, the smartphone of the uh, of the party that uh, is is interested in that status change. Um, so this is an example where you're taking multiple use cases, um, multiple uh, uh, industries, and in, in being able to effectively um, automate a process for a very compelling experience, high productive, highly productive um, process um, without having to do any type of uh, normalization of, of data to get to that point without, comp without any middleware or custom system integration. So the uh, McKinsey uh, two or three years ago came out with a pretty, um, in-depth report on what it, what is uh, the value of, of interoperability and or how, how how much impact does interoperability have on the full value of IoT is a better way to put it and they they indicated that in certain use cases certain industries that an additional 40 percent of value could be unlocked um, through this technology, if everything was able to to interoperate effectively, another way to look at it is if you look at it from a data scientist that's um, working on uh, artificial intelligence, biz business intelligence um, uh, systems, and, and processing all of this information from all these disparate sources. Um, a survey showed a year ago that you know they're spending most of their time on you know, just trying to gather up those disparate data sets and then cleaning and organizing that data before it can actually be used. So if you have a interoperable uh, framework that is being utilized by all these different sources of data, then their time can be much better spent on what they're, um, what they're paid for, which is to actually, you know, refine algorithms. Um, so, you know, the, the key objective of this article series as we talked about is to really try to broaden the perspectives of these various um, consortia, move towards the middle into a you know, set of blended approaches that can result in a common API and message payload format that sits between 
the transport protocol, and then a, a set of ontologies, including a top level ontology that, that, that also includes a information model defined as an ontology. And if we can get every, if a foundational layer of semantic interoperability based upon this, then all the vendors can start to, to differentiate themselves, vendors and businesses differentiate themselves through what you're putting on top of that interoperability. You know, the, the machine learning capabilities, the artificial intelligence, business inter intelligence, run times that dynamically generate user interface, all of the, the value add can be put on top of that interoper uh, interoperable foundation which will result in a significantly higher um, value. And you know, when we're talking about that 40% value, that, that, that's what'll, um, what can be achieved if, if we move in this direction. So um, now to the point of ending, this is where that article series is located. It's embedded-computing.com. Uh, then you go to IoT and then semantic interoperability. Five parts are currently published. The remaining four parts will be published um, probably once a month for the next four months. Um, so that's it. Um, I will then switch it back over to um, to see if there's any questions. The article series um, has significant detail. It, it's it's a uh, uh, enough detail to really be considered a reference architecture for a a reference implementation um, uh, that can demonstrate all of the uh, the use cases. It, it is intended to be a um, living series, so it'll be continually updated and uh, it'll reflect feedback. Um, so it is not a locked in proposed set of approaches. Um, it's an, if there are other approaches that need to be considered, then it, it'll be uh, updated to reflect those. Um, I have one comment. Um, it says, uh, can, uh, can you comment on specific mechanisms to define IoT ontologies? So I, I did not, <laughs> I did not include that, um, that slide. There are, for ontology definition, there are many different, well, there are a few different uh, ontology tools that, that are being used. Um, from the research that I've done and the feedback we've received, it, it appears that everything is really moving towards um, uh, RDF and, and, and OWL as really the, the hub for other uh, ontologies and you know, different models can be mapped to. Um, the article series, the next part, will actually um, discuss that in more detail about you know how RDF and you know, it gives some examples of RDF and OWL and you know the web of things um, work that's being done. Uh, but it will also propose that um, at a uh, at a uh, more shareable, scalable uh, level that 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 m the metadata that's being defined in those ontologies can be stored within that an event store, just as if just as data is can be maintained in an event store and transported um, as events. Um, you you can. Um, you can manage metadata in the same way as data to where it can be just as scalable, just as transportable as the data. And it really kind of blurs the line between what is data and metadata, because you can have you know, metadata that defines metadata. Um, and by having one uh, platform, one uh, framework, object management framework that can support all of that, I think it, it, it's worth considering. Um, are there any online RDF OWL ontologies that someone could check out? The, um, the next article will go into that in more detail. I would suggest taking a look at um, 
the uh, web of things work, but there's in just a simple search on RDF OWL and semantic interoperability, you will you will see a lot of, of um, papers that are and tutorials that are uh, that um, come up from that search. Um, again, RDF and OWL have been around for a long time and it was meant to provide semantics for the web, um, but it doesn't necessarily represent, I think, the ideal model for, you know, when you start throwing in IoT and, and, uh, and fog computing. The, the one thing that, that, that I have found when looking at uh, all of these consortia initiatives is that if you are relying on standards that are 10 years old or models that are were were conceived 10 years ago or more that they may be limiting what what can be achieved by by forcing you to 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 the confines of that model um and so you know one of the things you don't i don't think we're going to get to where we we can need to be unless we start adjusting our models and our older standards to reflect where we currently are and then we can leverage them we don't there's we don't need to reinvent things there's so much out there already that can be just connected together but they they need to be adjusted they need to be refreshed to really um, uh, be fully usable with uh, and, and be able to achieve all everything that uh, um, that we laid out <clears throat> in these use cases. Sustainability, scalability, and simplicity are, are really the key um, uh, things to consider when, when you're looking at all this. And you have to ask yourself, is it simple? Is what we're doing simple? Because if it starts to get complicated because you're working with older models and um, incorporating some patchwork in order really um, try to get it to achieve a purpose, then that probably is not the best way uh, to go about things. But I, I hope you'll um, take a look at the article series. It's, it, um, it really starts off with the fundamentals and kind of builds on it. There's lots of information. There's lots of uh, referenced um, papers. Um, there's hundreds of hours that went into research um, other other approaches and really try to compile it together. So if you spent some time going through it, it would probably save you a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of hours of work trying to um, recreate what we've done and with that knowledge. And uh, it's, if, uh, if you would like to make sure you get, um, you know, receive the, the last four parts if you wanted to connect with me on LinkedIn. And then uh, I'm, I always broadcast it through, uh, through my LinkedIn groups as well. Okay, thank you for your attention and um, I, hope, I hope it was helpful. Mm -hmm.